Good evening. Um, well, thank you for making it uh, to the first uh, lecture of the 2015-16 season. Uh, this is our seventh year in existence as a Center for Global Humanities. Uh, it's been an incredible journey. Uh, we, I remember when we, when we proposed the idea and how, when it was approved uh, by the president, who's been a big supporter of this center, uh, the Board of Trustees, some, uh, some, uh, uh, who's, some of whose members are present with us tonight. And of, of course, from my colleagues in administration and faculty, they've been extremely supportive about this initiative, about this particular initiative of the Center for Global Humanities, which seems to be a little bit out of place in a university that's dedicated to the health sciences, but not really, because we believe, very firmly believe, that a culture of the humanities, even though it is embattled and besieged these days, as you may have read in the Chronicle today and other places, um, that the humanities plays, they play a, a fundamental role in the edification and the creation of a healthier society. Uh, so our, our new tagline, innovation for a healthier planet, does include uh, things like political science, uh, English philosophy, um, you know, uh, fine arts and stuff like that, because they're absolutely crucial to the well-being of individuals in a society. And so this center was created with that in mind. Uh, it's also, it was also created for the community, our larger community here in Portland and beyond. It is open to the public. Everything is, we do is free and open to all of you and your friends, and please ask them to come in, uh, in more numbers. And uh, we have a reception every time we have a lecture. And, uh, and so uh, it's, it's a pleasant evening. We have had some members with us for many, many years, and we owe them a lot. And one of these days, we'll have a ceremony for them, and they think they know who they are. <laughs> uh, one of the pillars of the Center for Global Humanities, uh, Liz Bennett is not able to join us today, and she is uh, very sorry about that. She's not feeling well. Uh, but she's watching us online. And today we have had, we've added, we have streaming this lecture online on two platforms. One is the usual UNE CMS website, and the other one is on YouTube. And so, um, uh, and so people now in Morocco, friends of ours in Morocco, our students in Morocco, high students, uh, faculty with them, uh, colleagues in those places, some may be in France and Spain, uh, they said they may be watching us tonight, and if they are watching us, we say hello from Portland, Maine. And also, um, <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge people who've been with us in this center from since day one, Neil Jandro, Dave De Diego. Uh, they're both uh, there in the booth uh, taking care of the camera and uh, the videotaping of this event. Uh, they, they gave me strict instructions about how to behave and I'm trying to live up to them. And, uh, <clears throat> and so also my colleagues in communications, Dan there is with the camera, a very accomplished filmmaker. He's every, every, time, every time we have a session now, he's here with his camera taking uh, footage of these events, the historic events, as you may see from today's lecture, we have great topics to discuss and uh, and learn from. And uh, also, um, we have some members of the communications team. Crystal is here, Jen Porter that I've seen, uh, and 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 many others. Josh Pahigian is the one that the students are familiar with. He's the, he's teaching them this course. He's, he taught them the book uh, that is the subject of our discussion today. Uh, he's been with us at the University of New England for a long time. I can't remember how long Josh has been with us now. I mean, uh, seven, eight, ten. I don't know. Maybe more than that. More years. We've worked together ever since. Ever since he came to UNE. Um, and so I, I'd like to acknowledge all of you for, for making it tonight, uh, for helping this center grow and be what it is. Um, and I, I please spread the word about the value of this center because we definitely need it. And you're, as you're noticing the, the, the level and the caliber of discussion of this presidential debate, uh, we need a forum like this. We need to, to have a, we need to elevate the level of our thinking and discussion to be able to participate more meaningfully in the American democratic system. So, with this kind of preface, uh, I will now, uh, I will now, I'm now have the pleasure of introducing uh, Frank Pasquale, uh, whom I invited many a long time ago, maybe a year ago. He kindly accepted, and, and uh, we've been looking forward to his visit ever since. Frank Pasquale, uh, as you may have read 
in his biography, is a professor of law at the University of Maryland, as well as a member of the NSF-funded Council for Big Data, Ethics, and Society, and an affiliate fellow of Yale Law School's Information Society Project. He frequently lectures on the ethical, legal, and social implications of information technology for attorneys, physicians, and other health professionals. His book, The Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information, which was published by Harvard University Press this year, develops a social theory of reputation, search, and finance. His article about some of these issues, how to tame an internet troll, just appeared today in the Chronicle of Higher Education in the, in the Chronicle Review. Uh, he's a contributed, contributing writer to the Atlantic Magazine, <clears throat> and he is going to kick off the, uh, the, lecture, the lecture series Data and Society Program at the London School of Economics very soon. So we are very pleased and fortunate to have Frank Pasquale with us tonight. So please help me welcome him to the scene. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Anwar. That was just such a generous introduction. And um, it's a real honor to be here at the uh, Center for Global Humanities. Um, I've been following from afar uh, with admiration on the initiatives here. And I also just wanted to put in a special note of thanks to, to many of those of you in the audience who are attending, especially um, uh, Judge Lopez, who I once worked for. And um, he is, a, I know, a well-known a fixture of, uh, in Maine and uh, known for his jurisprudence and fairness. And uh, I think a lot of times that, you know, given how important it was to me as an attorney to have fantastic mentors like Judge Lopez, um, it's wonderful to be back in a position where I can try to uh, influence the thought of others or try to at least be a guide to some of the new uh, technologies in our world in the way that a judge like, like Judge Lopez was a guide to me when trying to first uh, navigate the law as a young lawyer. Um, and you might wonder, uh, why is a lawyer really interested in these topics of technology and ethics and society? And for me, this comes down fundamentally to an issue of how do we humanize technology and how do we assure that as we have incredibly rapid technological advances, that these technological advances are always seen as helpers or respecting our humanity rather than replacing humanity. And I think that this fundamental question of whether technology will respect us and respect our deepest values or will be seen as a way of replacing individuals uh, in a variety of contexts is really critical. Um, I do a lot of work on automation. I do a lot of work on sort of how search engines arrange information. But tonight, I'd love to reflect um, with you on how technology and our interactions with it affect us as individuals. And I wanted to start actually with a metaphor that I heard at a conference on public health, um, actually, from a few, uh, from last year, where Kelly Brownell was speaking. And uh, he's a great nutritionist. He works a lot in sort of food activism. And he made this very powerful metaphor. He said, if you look in South America among a lot of indigenous peoples who chew coca leaves, they can chew coca leaves throughout their lives oh. and you know, it's just sort of a natural remedy or it's just sort of something that they can chew on and, and have. And it doesn't sort of take over their lives the way that cocaine does, right? If you have cocaine, which is sort of the concentrated version of coca, that can really take over someone's life, addict them and ruin them. Brownell compared this to corn and corn syrup. He said, you know, if people are just eating corn, corn off the cob, you know, it can be a very healthy uh, uh, treat, you know, depending on how good the corn is, and it's going to be a very good way to sort of eat a healthy diet. But as condensed into corn syrup and a lot of the manufactured products that are in the American diet, that has definitely contributed to an obesity epidemic. Okay? And he constantly writes about this obesity epidemic. And he says that just as Paracelsus said of medicine, the dose makes the poison, that in many contexts, too concentrated engagement with anything, even if it's good, can really wreck us, can ruin us. And this sort of dose makes the poison was sort of his guide to a lot of problems in the American uh, food system. I've tried to deploy that metaphor with our experience of technology. So very often, you know, we are mediated by Facebook and our social interactions, 
by Google and in a lot of our search interactions, um, Instagram, all sorts of new things flowering for younger people like Yik Yak. Um, in romantic relationships, there's, uh, there's not just Tinder, there's literally 20 different or perhaps even hundreds of apps where people find one another you know, for love, for flings, what have you. And, and in all of these areas, there's this, uh, what began, I think, often as quite uh, progressive and sort of emancipatory technologies um, has been seen in various contexts as being almost enslaving people or addicting people to wanting one more click, et cetera. And it's something that even the Pope yesterday in um, his address to families in Philadelphia picked up on this point. Uh, the Pope said, you know, we, we live in a world where we're just chasing after one more like on Facebook, one more affirmation, et cetera. And he saw this as a sign of a form of spiritual sickness, you know, and, and, and sort of thought that this was a really problematic aspect of the formation of identities in modern life. Now, before elaborating on that point, though, I want to tell one sort of self-deflating story, which I think is really important for anyone engaging in these areas, um, which is... Adwar was kind enough to mention this, this piece that I had published this morning in the Chronicle of Higher Ed, which was a place I'd wanted to publish for a long time. I admire their commentary on higher ed. I spent a huge amount of effort writing a review of two books I thought were just brilliant. Um, and it was finally published uh, this morning. I'd waited for months for it to be published. And of course, one of the first things I did when it was published was I shared it to Facebook. And then I shared it to Twitter. And then I found myself sort of at the airport this morning on the way to Portland, sort of almost compulsively checking Facebook, like, how many people like this? Is this, is this reaching people? Oh, did people put a nice comment on it? Or no? Oh, oh, God. And, and so, and, and what, what is ironic is that, you know, even for those of us that try to spend time stepping back and reflecting on this digital sea that we're swimming in, there is still this incredible sort of almost uh, centripetal uh, or centrifugal, centrifugal pull toward the digital and toward interpreting likes or comments or other of these sort of binary tokens of digital affection or affirmation as keys to the value of our own selves. And, you know, as I get into this, uh, the ideas tonight, I want you to just know that I'm not holding myself out as some exemplar or someone who's figured out how to do the right digital fast or who's found the right uh, way of dealing with the digital. Rather, I think I'm just trying, someone who's uh, uh, swimming in it and uh, trying to make sense of it um, as I can. Now, to begin here in terms of you know, comparing what was social life like in the past versus what is it like in a hyper-connected age, uh, to use a term of uh, Nicole Duandre, who's a very interesting French uh, theorist in this area. In a hyper, you know, we've always been people looking for affirmation, people looking for connection. People have always been vain. There's always been accusations that every rising generation is narcissistic, et cetera. You know, so that, that's happened to my generation, it happens to millennials, it's gonna happen to Gen Z or whatever the next generation is called. That's always going to be a staple of social evaluation. But I think what's different about the current uh, sort of wave of uh, platforms on which people have to concern themselves about their reputation is the degree of quantification. So for example, on something like LinkedIn, where a lot of folks are trying to sort of groom a idealized version of themselves for consumption by potential employers, it's not as though one is just giving narratives of the self that you're hoping that someone else might connect with over time. There's really a pressure to accumulate as many connections as possible, then join as many groups as possible, then get as many endorsements as possible, then make sure that your endorsements are people who have been ranked high in your network, then see if the people who have been ranked high in your network have looked at your profile, then see if once they, you look at their profile, they look again at your profile. I mean, there's a certain form of an infinite regress of look, trying to quantify and to assign numerical value and ranking to things that are really inevitably ineffable or inevitably very hard to uh, rank, or if they are ranked, are ranked somewhat arbitrarily. And you saw this at the beginning or in part of Dave Ager's novel, The Circle, where I think one of the characters, she's introduced in the novel not as, say, a high school student that has certain interests and that has certain hobbies and does either well or poorly in school or has uh, a like for math or a like for essays in English. She's described as 
the student who ranks 1,384 in her metropolitan region, you know, there's sort of, there's been assigned to her this kind of all-encompassing, commensurating ranking and rating. And this was a part of science fiction. It's a part of several, you know, science fictionish novels like um, Gary Steingart's Super Sad True Love Story, which I, I highly recommend to anyone in the humanities. It's a really interesting look at the future. It's increasingly a motif of various novels that you see this type of ranking and rating and people constantly trying to assess how attractive they are, how successful they are, how wealthy they are, their reputation, et cetera. Um, and this, I think, is a sign of a culture that is increasingly dependent on numerical evaluation. Who cares how good the numerical evaluation is? Let's just make sure we get everybody ranked and rated, et cetera. And this is a big theme of the Black Box Society, the, the book that I published earlier this year, because very often these reputational systems, we don't really know how they work on the inside. So while they have the patina of technical superiority, you know, these computer scientists, Silicon Valley, the smartest people, the best and the brightest as they're often called, that form of admiration for them sort of rubs off on the, so the social software that they're giving us. And we too often lose the ability to look at that social software critically, okay? We, we have to really look at it critically and say, especially when we don't know exactly how, say, something like LinkedIn works, or even credit scores. We don't really even know how credit scores work. Then, uh, in terms of like the exact algorithms that set them, um, then we have to be somewhat skeptical about these forms of reputation and how they're affecting our cultivation of ourselves, the way we view ourselves, and the way we uh, sort of assess and deal with others. I think that the key here also is that the reason why these types of forms of quantification are so compelling you know, I mean, by the way, there's a, there's a song, just to give another example of this quantification, there's this kind of funny, frivolous song called Let Me Take a Selfie. And the singer is sort of talking about all the, how important it is that so she looks just right. And then she says, oh, my last post just got 10 likes. Should I take it down? You know, and this is, again, this is something that people, so often is going on in people's minds on these platforms, you know, how liked is it or how disliked is it? When we think about, you know, what is the origins of these sorts of modes of self-recognition or self-evaluation, it often does boil down to an idea that there's an algorithmic self. And what I mean by the algorithmic self is that there are ways of behaving in any given situation that are optimal and that one should follow them. And that if one follows them, one can maximize whatever one's performance is to be. And this, I think that's sort of the core problem that we're facing when we're looking at sort of the effect of some of these technologies on the self. And that ideally, we can pull that back and look more critically at it and at these platforms. And I think one of the big tools for that is the humanities. You know, it is precisely in the sort of self-reflectiveness of, say, a George Eliot as evinced in Middlemarch, where the characters, where she sort of presents these characters gives a sense of their inner lives, and then steps back and reflects on them. It's that practice in being able to step back from oneself and one's own, um, uh, the, the world one's thrown in, I think that really is critical. I also think that the social sciences are critical because they give us the tools to understand what's going on in the digital world, not simply as players in a game that has been set up for us, but as people that could think of ways for the game to be better. Okay. So one example that is really critical there um, that just happened last year was Facebook announced an experiment where they were essentially going to uh, take a group of 700,000 users of Facebook and half of them would see more posts that had negative emotions or sadness in them and half of them would have more posts that had positive emotions or happiness in them. And Facebook was going to analyze the emotional response of people who were sort of brought down by their feed and people that were brought up by their feed, okay? And one of the things that this is so interesting about this experiment is, you know, on one level, people might worry, am I living in a digital Truman show? You know, if you remember this movie, it was about a, a character who, you know, is just going about his daily business and then he finds out, I guess when he's about 35 or 40, that he's actually living in a reality show where he's the only one that's not aware it's a reality show. 
And this, I think, is, is a real problem if you combine the fact that Facebook is running these experiments, the other big digital firms are running these experiments. They're, they're all over the place. And yet, because they are outside of either a health system or educational infrastructure, there's no real institutional review boards or others to comment on the ethics of them. Um, now, sometimes people are seen to have their comeuppance because of this. It was recently revealed, it hasn't been completely confirmed, but you may have heard of this Ashley Madison hack, where you know, everyone is sort of, all, all these accounts were hacked and exposed and put online. Some researchers have alleged that there were 770,000 men on Ashley Madison and only 10,000 real women, but 200,000 bots impersonating women, okay? <laughs> And so these bots would just sort of go around and just keep men, keep the interest up of the people that had wanted affairs on this site. Um, and they were sort of just this, and yet again, we have this Truman Show problem, right, of an online digital environment that because it is impenetrable to critical inquiry from the outside, we just tend to assume in the academy that, oh, that's a business secret, that's a trade secret, that that's all proprietary. We can't ever look at it as researchers unless we get very narrow uh, and, and often pricey permission. That, I think, is still very problematic. And we have to wonder, you know, how many other digital environments might be created in the same image eventually if we continue to live in a digital world where it is so hard for outside entities to understand those who are shaping that world. Um, that is further, you know, sort of imagined in the film Her. So for those of you who haven't seen the film Her, it was just a, a brilliant film about a world in which very advanced computer algorithms have essentially captured literally billions of conversations. I mean, and perhaps they went to the NSA to get these, perhaps they went to, you know, uh, carriers that might be uh, keeping them in, in files or uh, for long-term storage. And out of those, those conversations, they essentially figured out a way in which an operating system could perfectly simulate the voice of a loving companion or friend, okay? So the guy who's in the film just sort of decides to sign up for this digital assistant, but it turns out that gradually, the digital assistant is so helpful and so caring in what he hears via his phone, like a Siri or some sort of digital assistant like that, that he falls in love with her, okay? Now, again, there's a form of comeuppance for the man in this, uh, in this story. He finds out that his digital assistant is actually also in love with 680,000 other men. Um, <laughs> you know, so that's, that's the advantage of scale, right? Um, but uh, but, but it's, it's really quite a moving story because it is so sensitively told from the perspective, not just of the man who sort of is gradually falling in love with an operating system, but also from his friends who have to decide whether they invite him and uh, the, the operating system on a picnic together, right? And ta accepting her as his mate or something like that. I mean, it's, it's taken and told from the perspective of um, the operating system itself in a way, um, who is sort of presumed to have some higher level of computational cognition. And I think that this question, uh, I, I, the, the movie itself tries to explore this question of respect versus replacement in a really subtle and sensitive way. Um, there's also a film called Ex Machina, which you know, takes it to another level, this question of can a robot replace human companionship? And finally, we see it in the development of new companions for the elderly or the infirm that are either robotic companions or in the case of the paro, is something that looks like a seal and that when it interacts with um, those with dementia is programmed to sort of look up and look concerned and blink at the person that whenever the person says anything to it. And this has been sort of scientifically proven to have an effect of reducing stress and increasing observed levels of happiness among those with dementia. And, and so this, this question will come up again and again. The people who've developed this uh, product have said, well, this allows this creates conversations between those with, uh, who might be in certain stages of Alzheimer's and their caregivers They can talk about this particular uh, robot, this furry seal robot. But then there are others who say, well, that we're on a fast track toward that robot just simply replacing human companionship. That, I think, is the argument of Sherry Turkle, who had a very smart piece in the New York Times yesterday and who has a book sort of on this, this, these increasing problems. Now, in most people's lives, this replacement versus um, respect or recognition dichotomy is not that intense. 
One of the examples that Turkle gives uh, is in college students whom she studies. Apparently the rule at the dining hall is that, let's say there's a group of six or seven, they have a rule of three. And the rule of three is that as long as three people are looking at the person talking during the conversation, then the others can look at their phone. Okay. <laughs> which, you know, again, is this very interesting uh, way in which folks that are, you know, in the vanguard, uh, younger, younger individuals who are uh, you know, more and more exposed or have been exposed from the very beginnings of their experience of sociality to these forms of technology are trying to negotiate some middle way. You know, other people, you know, choose like to have a digital fast for one day or, or um, they, they, there's other coping mechanisms or other strategies. But I think sort of becoming more self-conscious about those strategies is going to be a really interesting aspect of the negotiation or conversation about the future of friendships and relationships. Because there just is so, there are so many opportunities um, for this sort of world on the internet to impinge on and distract individuals from the experience that they happen to be living at the moment. Now, you might wonder, What's the ultimate harm of all these, these things? You know, you might say, well, it's maybe we're gonna have some societies or some groups of people that are just gonna be obsessively looking at their phones all the time, and we're gonna have others that serve more value face-to-face -face interaction and let a thousand flowers bloom. I think though that that level of either acquiescence or nonchalance about the dominance of digital technologies in our personal experience is not justified, and I'll give two reasons for that. One is that if you look at the folks that are running many of the largest internet companies, they are learning lessons from or even hiring personnel who have pioneered things like uh, internet gambling, okay? So if you look at Natasha Dow Scholl's book, Ad Addiction by Design, she's examined the people that make the software for slot machines or video poker or other things in Las Vegas or other states that have gambling. And the key to a lot of the experience of these, video, of these designers of gambling games is to maximize time on machine, okay? If they can get people to get time on machine. What's also really amazing is that for the people whom they really addict to gambling, those people often even want fewer payoffs because they're gambling not for the payoff, they know they're not gonna win. They're gambling essentially for the sort of un uninterrupted, zoned out bliss experience of just continually stimulus response, stimulus response, stimulus response. And this is a, a very troubling, and, and actually this also impinges on law because folks in Nevada had to adjust regulations with respect to how algorithmic design of gambling machines could be predicated on things like um, facial recognition or videotaping or observation of how people are interacting with the machine to optimize efforts to keep those people on the machine, okay? Well, all of these sort of methods that may have been pioneered with internet addiction, or, or I'm sorry, with, with gambling addiction, with these sort of video poker interfaces or other things, all of those are at least informing. They may not be driving, but they are at least informing those who are making our games, our apps, our Facebook interactions, our other social network interactions, even dating apps, right? And so if we live in a world in which we can't fully understand the code or we, don't, or we aren't trained as students from a very early age to recognize, okay, how can I step back from this app? How can I step back from this experience? How do I critically evaluate it? What's the real goal of the person behind it? If we don't have that, that's almost like being illiterate like 200 years ago, right? If we don't have that kind of critical awareness, it's almost like being someone who's going through the world and you know, a person who's illiterate 200 years ago certainly could have a good life in, in, in some set settings. But on the other hand, would they really understand how government worked, how laws worked, how their workplace, you know, what, were the, what was the governing principle of the corporation they worked at or, or, or the, the land where they were, they were living? They really wouldn't know that. And I think that is, that is the worry, I think, when we do not have um, that type of critical awareness. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to learn, needs to, learn to code. You know? A lot of people misinterpret that type of critique as saying, well, we all have to become coders and develop our own Facebook or our own you know, thing. I mean, ironically, um, many times the very value of these platforms comes from 
almost universal participation, right? We don't all have to have six different social network profiles we're maintaining, um, or at least if, if we are satisfied by the Facebook one. But what I am saying, though, is that we need to have much more consciousness, I think from a much earlier age, that the agendas of the people behind the dominant digital properties in our lives may not match our own. That, I think, is the key idea. And when I saw her, you know, my immediate thought was, wow, I wonder what profit-seeking entity has programmed the her to keep this guy on the phone for as long as possible, right? I was thinking, like, what's the business angle? Because, frankly, so often, you know, when you look at these types of, uh, uh, of algorithmic interactions, that is what is driving things. The other thing that I think is quite critical in thinking about the, this area is a term that Julie Cohen calls modulated selfhood. So if you take the law, you, you may feel like, well, internet addiction happens to a very small number of people. That's not really a huge problem, um, even if, if students are walking, watching it all the time or if there's other, other folks that are sort of addicted and they're not interacting with their family enough. Well, that's their choice, et cetera. But I think that also might fail to recognize the degree to which we are modulated into certain patterns of behavior and that once we deviate from them, that these big data systems can flag us as being in some way problematic. Um, and I think that that is a real concern that ultimately behind all these data capture systems, they're not simply capturing data for the sake of capturing data. They're ultimately creating systems of rewards and penalties that are rewarding people for a certain type of behavior and penalizing them for another. To give one really just, just a, a blunt example, um, it's, it was often said uh, by a Chicago law professor uh, that lawyers did not make good tenants because they were, it was afraid that they would sue. So landlords were afraid that lawyers would sue, so they wouldn't uh, rent to them. And that this stigma was sort of harming the legal profession. And ultimately, you know, that, that I think has sort of faded away somewhat, but one of the reasons it's faded away is because there are so many new stigmatizing databases that can identify the people who sue that landlords don't need to have the heuristic of, oh, is the person a lawyer, they're, they're litigious. They can actually go to the data and decide not to rent from people who sue them, who have sued other landlords, okay? Now, you might think, that's a good thing, particularly if you're a landlord, right? <laughs> you know, and certainly there are lots of um, cases out there that are meritless, that are put forward by tenants. But on the other hand, what I worry about is that sometimes these systems of reputation and control over individuals, and there's so much data available about them, can actually discourage socially useful forms of litigation or socially useful forms of expression. I think there was a study that came out recently after, very soon after the Snowden revelations and asked, uh, individuals, are you watching yourself? Are you watching what you say online? Because now you have so much more knowledge of the surveillance systems that are in place. You know, the same surveillance systems that would be used to create something like the her in Syria, or the same surveillance systems that could be piggybacked on by the NSA when Facebook is running its, its experiments. And they clearly found that people were, that there was a very sizable plurality of people that were changing their behavior uh, because they were fearful of this type of dragnet surveillance or because they were fearful that some sort of action out of the ordinary would get them flagged by some algorithm. And finally, I think that a lot of the efforts by um, people who want to help others hide their identities or hide their actions online feed also on this type of fear. So there's increasing worries that say variable pricing algorithms are going to watch what you do online and they're always billed as giving you the right kind of discounts. But what they're also doing is they're watching for what you really want and they're gonna charge you more for that. Now there's debates in California now and in other places about whether to restrict that form of dynamic pricing, variable pricing, data-driven pricing, et cetera. But you know, a lot of people say, oh, that's so foreign, that's so bizarre, it'll never happen. But if you look at the price of credit for many individuals, it's, it's on a, based on exactly that sort of system. And the credit scoring you know, now has moved beyond like just going after, looking at um, individuals' credit histories, there are now credit scores available that look at much more 360 degree surveillance of individuals. And Facebook has a patent for something that will base credit evaluations on your friend list. So if you have friends that are all doing pretty well and paying off their bills, then that may raise your credit score from the Facebook evaluation. If you have ones that are doing badly, then maybe you should unfriend them. That's the message, right? <laughs> and, and, and this sort of, this I think is very problematic because that raises a third concern, right? And the third concern is one of, the first concern was hidden agendas. 
The second concern was modulated selfhood. The third concern um, arises because that leads to a form of a, of a death spiral of disadvantage for people that are marked out by these algorithms, right? Or are somehow disadvantaged by them. It's bad enough to say be sick and not to be able to pay one's bills. But it's horrifying to imagine a future where some scoring system could use the fact of one's sickness or the fact of one's not paying bills, et cetera. Or people could perceive friendship or other association with that person as being somehow problematic. It's horrifying to think of that as driving stigmatization and further pushing people down when in fact all that the data systems are doing is trying to project a past based, project a future based on a past, but they're only looking at one particularly partial data point. So these three problems are, are themes of the black box society and they're themes of my later work on the influence of technology on the self. So you might wonder, you know, what can be done about this, right? I mean, it, it often seems as though <laughs> there's so many digital critics that are out there who are saying, well, we are, we are subject to forces that are beyond our control. Um, and I think that there are, though, many, many ways in which we can resist and that we can try to inflect more humanely what these new digital systems are doing to us. The first, and, and something that actually I'm, I'm running a conference at Yale this spring on, is called algorithmic accountability among the professions. And what I'm trying to do there is, there's, there's, I, I should give you the backstory about what, what we're reacting against first, and then I'll talk about our positive movement. There's been a lot of folks, uh, especially in Silicon Valley, but sometimes favored by Wall Street firms as well, who say, you know, all the, we're gonna replace all the dermatologists with an app. All the dermatology is is just looking at a pattern, and if you have a computer that has 30 million pictures of moles and 1 million are the bad moles or the melanomas and 29 million are the good moles. We're just going to give this app to everybody. They'll take a picture of their mole. They won't ever need to go into the dermatologist, right? Or we'll cut out 30% of dermatology visits that are sort of diagnoses of benign um, skin conditions, right? This is a, a theory that has been put forward again and again for so many professions. It's been put forward that there could be robotic nurses or robotic pharmacists. You know, there's this, actually this robot that has eight arms that is now a robotic pharmacist in several hospitals, right? So that's one way in which that's being implemented. There is an argument for robotic lawyers, that all that law is is essentially a form of pattern recognition of what patterns of words will eventually affect a judge most positively. There's a startup, startup called Lex Machina that operates on that, that, that idea. So in all of these different areas, oh, in journalism, there's now robots that write news stories, right? So you have all of these areas where essentially you have this sort of stimulus response, algorithmic self, modeled as a robot by software. And what we're trying to do at the Yale conference uh, in the spring is we're trying to say essentially, no, the role of robotics and software is to aid the professions, it's not to replace them. So for example, if your conception of what pharmacy is, is that you simply can have an eight tentacled robot putting pills and bottles and giving them to people as they're leaving, that's actually a very limited and limiting conception of the profession. That in fact, there's lots of other things that many community pharmacists do. There's lots of integration of pharmacists into integrated community health management plans under the Affordable Care Act. Um, there's patient-centered medical homes and patient-centered medical neighborhoods that are part of a larger healthcare movement that is focused on outcomes and not just on fee-for-service and procedures on individuals. There are many, many ways in which these folks that are seen as either disposable, dispensable, replaceable, in fact can play critical roles in areas of the economy that are very difficult or impossible to automate. One other thing though that I think is a very good reality check for those who say, oh, all the jobs, jobs are gonna be automated. I mean, what do they do if they have a cracked windshield? You know, it's almost impossible to imagine like how they're going to use a robot to like get the car to the windshield place and negotiate the price and fix the windshield robotically, et cetera. Maybe that's happening in 20, 30 years, but really it's not that great a concern right now. But my worry is that the types of algorithmic interactions that we're being conditioned to in the context of social networks and these other sorts of environments are leading to a common public narrative and a common financial narrative that the future is just robotization and mass unemployment. 
and we're trying to push back against that. It's very similar with law, right? We have conceptions of law where there's some people who say, well, terms of service and contracts, they can all be automated and automatically interpreted. You don't really need lawyers for lots of contract drafting. You don't need lawyers even for brief writing because a computer can find the cases involved in the given controversy that went the right side of the plaintiff, et cetera. And again, this is such a common narrative. You hear this constantly in the legal press and the, and the legal trade press. But um, in a piece called Four Futures of Legal Automation, I and a computer programmer, we co-authored and we looked together at the real possibilities for automation. And we found them to be actually sizably overestimated. Um, and what's amazing too is the press here the press is often not our friends when they report on this because they reported that a study from Oxford that said that 47% of jobs would be automated, they said, the press said about that study, oh, and that shows that all the lawyers are gonna be gone too. If you read the study, it actually puts law as one of the professions less likely to be automated. There's like three categories, more likely, moderate likelihood, less likely, almost all the legal jobs are in the last one. But because there's such a cultural narrative of I believe the sort of dispensability, replaceability of the other, almost an algorithmic relationship with others, we don't see it. And it can be very hard to see, and, and, it, and it sort of is hard to, to develop the counter narrative. The other examples, though, that I would say are really critical beyond enabling professions to be domain experts that are respected by technical experts and that work together with technical experts, I think that's one part of a program of responding to this algorithmization of selfhood. Another is making sure that we have time to cultivate sources of value and meaning and connection that are sort of outside of the digital realm, right? And this is where I get in a lot of uh, controversies with folks who accuse me of digital dualism, right? There's a, there's a school that says, well, you know, if someone wants to spend all their time online and just be entirely engaged with it, that's totally fine because that isn't, you know, that's their choice. And you, know, you, you see it perhaps in eSports where people are sort of gathering around in a big arena and they're not watching a sort of sports match of say a football game, they're watching people playing a video game controlling football game players. So it's sort of people watching others playing games is sort of often seen as the future of sports and, 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 I, and I have to resist it because I think that it sort of denies something essential about our embodiment and sort of the nature of being a person that you know, there's something that really is not reducible to a continual engagement with tokens of humanity in a computer screen no matter how far advanced virtual reality gets, no matter how good the Apple Retina display is, et cetera. Um, but I know that's controversial, so I will, I'd love to hear questions pushing back on that. Um, I'll just say in conclusion that I believe that this, the, the worry about automation and the worry about technology, it's very easy in each of these areas to become defeatist or to become nihilistic or simply to drift to simply say, well, there's folks that did really well at computer science and they're sort of in charge of the platforms that run our lives and we're gonna play second fiddle to them because everything's a matter of pattern recognition and the people with the most data and the most better, best pattern recognizers are going to win and are going to control the professions and are going to sort of influence increasing control over terms of daily life. I disagree with that because I've, in my studies of all of these different areas of search and reputation and finance, the firms that run the social networks, the search engines, others, I find that what is often billed as technical advance and expertise um, and insuperable competitive prowess often boils down to you know, good luck. They were there in the right place at the right time. You know? and, and, and also I think that there are so many things to be learned from the professions and to be learned from alternative sources of meaning and value that we can't simply uh, sort of drift into a world in which uh, we accept wholeheartedly technological mediations in so many intimate domains and in so many commercial domains without trying to fully understand, first, their negative effects on society, second, the social scientific and humanistic values that can guide us in evaluating them, and finally, alternative sources of meaning and values and governance that are going to allow a future where automation is going to be respecting and helping human beings rather than replacing them. So that, uh, thank you. Thanks. 
At this time, we'll open it up for some audience questions. And I remind you to please speak right into the microphone when I hand it to you or my friend Neil does, just so that we can all hear you. Um, who would like to start us off? Here you go, sir. Um, at the beginning of your talk, I wrote down uh, two questions. How do we humanize technology? And how do we make technology respect us? Uh, these do seem like important questions to me, but I didn't hear as much by way of an answer to either question as I had hoped. I, uh -huh. One statement I wrote down toward the end was pushing back against robotization, but at least to me, this doesn't sound like a winning strategy. Uh, How about the pharmacist example? I mean, do you think that essentially, so I mean, that, that was a relatively concrete one. Mm -hmm. Is your sense that essentially that the pharmacy is a field that basically boils down to something, perhaps a black box, taking pills from one bottle, putting them in another, and giving them to a person in response to computerized physician order entry? Or would you go along with what I was sort of trying to evoke, which was that pharmacy could be part of an interprofessional collaboration to optimize health outcomes, particularly given the fragmentation of the American healthcare system? Well, uh, I'm not a pharmacist, but actually my wife uh, died a few weeks ago, and I picked up a lot of pills for the last year and a half for her, and my sense was that there was a lot of pill dispensing going on at the local pharmacy whenever I went over there. I, I, and, and I have, I have one response, Regarding though. robots, I just think that we're going to see more robots. And if your goal is just to fight the robots, I, I, I don't see that as a, as a winning strategy. But the question is, uh, I may have missed part of your talk. Do you have more concrete uh, uh, suggestions about how to make technology respect us more rather than to replace us? Sure, sure. So I want to actually get into one thing, though. Just I want to continue the pharmacy example a little bit further because I was the um, uh, chief caregiver for my mother for some time uh, when she was uh, uh, she had, was pretty ill for a number of years. And one of the things that I thought was really extraordinary about one of the pharmacists that we dealt with was, first of all, he didn't see his job as simply being dispensing pills. He also intimately knew the regulations uh, that were part of Medicare Part D. He understood the tiering of prescription drug medications and the relative risks trade-offs involved in getting various forms of generics as opposed to the brand name drugs. And he sort of took the initiative there and really made an effort to be of more, I think, uh, above and beyond the usual, say, standard of care of that type of medical professional. What I think the, the conference that I'm trying to organize and the other larger movement toward algorithmic accountability that I'm trying to organize, our main purpose, essentially, is to give opportunities to people that feel, say, the threat of automation in their daily workplace, those types of chances to go, say, above and beyond, think of innovative ways of, of uh, acting in the economy, et cetera. And I, I think that is one thing, way to go. However, I would also say, though, there are some places where I would just flatly say, no, a robot can't make the decision. So for example, I mean, I think that you could look at the financial regulations. This is in chapter four of my book. It looks at the financial regulations regarding the allocation of credit and the way that banks make decisions about how they offer credit. It turns out that thanks to some very well-meaning regulations related to anti-discrimination law, lots of banks interpreted those to think that to avoid discrimination lawsuits, they should make all of their credit judgments algorithmic. Well, what the algorithmatization of credit scoring and credit allocation did was, A, it allowed banks to fire a lot of loan officers, right? If you've got a computer program that can do it, you can say, well, all we got to do is see if they've got a 660 FICO or not, and then we give them credit or not. Well, of course, though, what ends up happening is that very smart financiers figure out ways to give out loans that are subprime, and then there's all these sort of ways in which the machine gets manipulated. And the manipulation, part of the story I tell in my book is how important it was that people in Wall Street figured out ways to manipulate this machine, and they may have been stopped had there been loan officers with judgment who were able to actually understand local economic conditions rather than rubber stamping everything that was 660. Um, I have another example that I want to give, but maybe I'll, I'll hold it until we have other, other comments. Is there any other comments or questions? Or? Gosh, what was the other example? As I... Yeah. OK. Um, quick question. 
Um, this is global humanities, and a lot of what you're talking about with technology is, seems to be very driven with some of the societies that are a little bit more advanced. How do sure. you see technology affecting other areas of the world that may not have the same um, programming, I don't know, programming bias or, you know, all of the things that we have available in the U.S. and, and in Europe? It's a great question. And I mean, I think the way, the concrete way I'd, I would love to address that is in the zero rating, there's a program now that Facebook is, inter, is spearheading via internet.org to bring the internet to a lot of the less developed world, particularly in India. And um, this program would distribute phones, or they would have cell phones that would uh, allow them to surf for free Facebook and some partner sites, but then they would have to pay for a lot of the rest of the internet, or a lot of the rest of the internet, right? Or it would go up to, a, there are various ways that you could arrange that. And one of the things that I worry about when I think about the less developed world is, will it develop on terms set by often monopolizing and monopolistic corporations um, from the West? I think that one, uh, there is some resistance to this way of connecting people in India, but on the other hand, it's sort of a tragic choice, right? Because if the choice is, well, you get sort of a Facebookified internet, or you get no internet, I'd probably want the Facebook of internet, you know, if I, given, and you know, there are, I think 70% of the global population lives on less than $10 a day, or I think, so you know, you have a huge portion of folks that are not living on a huge amount of money that would really welcome this. So I do think that's a problem. The other thing that I would add, though, about the algorithm itself in the Indian context, is I just heard a great talk by uh, Malavika Jayaram on the Indian government's biometric identification system. And what the Indian government is doing is they're trying to develop a really good biometric identification system that takes everyone's, I think, thumbprints and perhaps even iris scans, I'm not certain. But they want to create this record of everyone. And ideally, that will reduce corruption. But I also worry that you know, if you have that level of intimate knowledge of people's biometrics at the hands of the state or its private, part private uh, partnerships, that is a scary degree of power. And we're going to, you know, have to be talking about that for some time. But I, I, I think that, you know, in the less developed world, a final example I'll give, too, about this sort of algorithmization of labor and sort of mediation of labor by technology is a program called Text Eagle, which would enable people, particularly in Africa, to do what are called human intelligence tasks at a penny a task. So they could log into their account and sort of be given some, like, identify this picture. Is there a car in this picture? And you hit yes or no, and if you hit the right, and then you get a penny for each one that you categorize, right? Um, this is being heralded by some people as a really great advance to, you know, end global poverty. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that that really is, you know, that, 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 and, I, and I worry about um, the way in which that's being done. I'm actually, to come back to concrete solutions, I'm, I'm doing another meeting in New York on something called platform cooperativism, which is essentially trying to figure out ways that, say, drivers themselves could own the app rather than Uber owning it, right? Or, you know, I'm sure people have heard of Uber, right? And I think that's even being legislated in Maine right now, I mean, some of the Uber issues. So we're trying to think of ways in which, say, you could have workers themselves own the apps that are arranging their labor um, as alternatives. And that, I think, is going to be a big pushback in the global south, is to say, how do we develop the technology that lets us arrange um, things in our own way rather than just accepting whatever happens to be the dictates or the preferred methods of the largest internet companies. So yeah. Oh, yeah. I think he's got a microphone coming down. See, here you go, sir. Oh, yeah. In medicine, let's take your uh, pharmacy example. Uh -huh. In moving the pharmacist away from pill dispensing to uh -huh. actually pharmaceutical review, um, the algorithms that they have don't or are not perfect in terms of their ability to really tease out what the proper answer is. A classic example of this is if I have a patient who has a penicillin allergy, and it's an illness that I can use a cephalexin, yeah. part of the cephalosporin group, I will get a kickback from the pharmacist saying, you should not be using cephalosporin because there's a crossover reactivity in patients who are allergic to penicillin. Right. Now, the problem is that I have never seen an adverse reaction of cephalexin 
in a penicillin allergic patient sure. in 42 years. <laughs> yeah. The algorithm insists that I pay attention to it. Yeah. Yet what the algorithm lacks is that measured judgment yeah. Yeah. where it says, you need to look at this. It doesn't tell me, is there a 5% crossover? Is there a 10, 15, 90%? All it says is it just throws it back to me that now I have to explain to a patient why it is I'm gonna go ahead and give a, a drug that a pharmacist says can produce adverse reactions. So I think that a lot of these algorithms, particularly in a complex area like medicine and probably law, have limited application. But what they often lack is judgment and that ability to fine tune the right answer um, that really is an important thing, whether it's a patient or a client in law. That is a wonderful point. And I, one of the papers, I, I supervised a paper by a joint law and pharmacy student last year that was on drug-drug interaction alerts. Um, and so one of the big problems that doctors are facing now is exactly this issue where there are these software vendors are selling systems to hospitals that will just alert on anything, you know, on any potential problem. And this is leading to hospitals to just turn them off entirely, and then the thing misses a huge problem. You know, there's a, there's a recent book that involved uh, uh, someone was given 43 times the dose of antibiotics that they were supposed to be given because it was dosed per kilogram as opposed to per person or something like that. And what we tried to do in the paper that, that um, uh, she did and the, you know, some of my follow-up work on, in this sort of area of drug-drug interaction is exactly your point about how do you sort of create a communication system that could encode some of the levels of subtlety, nuance that are common in human communication. And it's something too, when you think about how easy it is to get in a fight over email versus like face to face, you know, it's very easy over email to just misinterpret and say, you really, you know, in a, I mean, I've done this enough myself to know, you know, whereas like if face to face, it would never happen. It just wouldn't happen if you, if you had that. And I think it's very similar in the situation, you know, if that um, happened. But, but I guess your complaint is that pharmacy as now practiced is being controlled by algorithms and these algorithms are messing up the judgment inherent in the practice of medicine. Yeah, that's very problematic, yeah. I was thinking there was done one down here, actually, yeah. yeah. Here you go, ma'am. Uh, uh, well, I'm aware of huge areas of interpersonal energy exchange which cannot be codified into digital translation. And there are a lot of studies about the powers of touch and sensory activity yeah. Similarly, you and I look at each other, we may not say a word, but there's traffic going on between us. Yeah. And what I'm concerned about, they've done some studies with kids where they put them, believe it or not kids, on uh, technology diets <laughs> where they are deprived of access. And they measure them before, and they measure them whatever it is two months later. There are huge changes for the positive from that deprivation. Now, I'm not against technology, but I am seeing it almost having a cancerous growth, which is in, in, what should I say, imposing on other areas of our brain. If you don't use your right hand, the brain begins to atrophy. Certain signals don't go through the amygdala uh, that come off the computer. That's our social emotional stuff. Yeah. So I'm very, very concerned about this and uh, how we can activate greater awareness of what we're just beginning to understand about the human brain and what turns it on and what could empower it. So I'd love to hear your comments and reflections a little bit around that area. Yes, and I think um, I first want to completely affirm my agreement with, with your direction here because I think you're exactly right to say that there are forms of human interaction and social knowledge and tacit knowledge that atrophy in the absence of the face-to-face. My only worry is that given the increased competitiveness of many workplaces, that if we take it from a Darwinian view, the person who lacks empathy may actually be fittest to survive in the contemporary economy. 
And that is something where I think we always have to connect the, social, the psychological and the individual level to the political economy that we live in. Because, I mean, I've certainly seen, you know, quite brilliant, gifted uh, professionals who, you know, have this like Dr. House problem, right? I mean, like, the, you know, he's just like this very like brusque, mean spirit, et cetera, person. And I think that's one of the areas where as managers, as professors, as leaders in an organization, we have to learn to value that. One thing I've noticed too in some workplaces I've been to is I've been to workplaces where they carve out and structure time for totally unstructured interaction among the employees and the uh, folks there. Those places always struck me as being so much better run and there's so much more of a higher level of trust and ability for creativity than places where it's all just efficient. It's just, you know, every minute is accounted for of every day, et cetera. And I've seen this at law firms. I've seen it at, at colleges and universities. And so I think that's a really critical advantage. And, and hopefully we'll eventually live in times where that type of carving out of the personal is valued more and is seen as, and its, and its value is widely recognized rather than just being seen as like a perk or something. Yeah. There's also a curious correlation in the number of dogs that have been appearing in our part of the world in Portland. And huh. I believe that there's so much people, and when I say they're sensually deprived, one thing a dog will give you is that. So there's tons, there's a great increase in the number of dogs. Yeah. On the negative <laughs> side, you watch drivers, and I sometimes think they must be seeking some kind of horrible sensory excitement that they're not able to get any other way. I can't account for their behavior any other way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is funny. It's, it's very interesting, that connection. Yeah, yeah. No. I think we have a question right here um, in response to something this other gentleman was saying. No, it's not actually in response. It's just a, a, a follow-up question, which is a concern that I would have is that if um, you've got these um, algorithmic um, formulaic um, um, uh, programs that can tell you where there's in drug interactions, um, and then you've got a doctor using his absolute or her absolute best judgment, um, and that judgment is based on years and years of experience and no untoward experiences, and then there is a, an untoward experience. What kind of um, legal or culpable uh, position Excellent. does that person now be put in, and therefore does do these programs serve as a huge deterrent to people to use their best judgment, in which case we have really regressed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to clap with that, but, <laughs> but I, I agree with you, and I actually, this is another big theme that I think is completely underrecognized in the automation literature. So if you look at literatures, particularly of economists, on the automation of medicine, other professions, other areas, of, other areas they never fully recognize the role of law and policy in guiding where it's gonna go. So you're exactly right to say that like, if the courts hold that the standard of care is to defer to an algorithm, suddenly that becomes medical practice in a way for a large number of people. But if the courts hold that essentially the older standard of care uh, should prevail, then it doesn't. And similarly, you know, something that even lawyers overlook is the funding mechanisms. So, you know, if the if we see eventually, and by the way, when you you, you may have seen that thing last week about the drug where the price was raised five thousand percent, you know, that sort of thing, that is the vanguard of a number of struggles between, say, member makers of technology and chemicals versus professionals over a slice of a pie, health spending, right? Because the pharmacists say, we're, or the, not the pharmacists, the drug makers say, well, we're actually curing. Like, what the doctor is giving is just, you know, that we could just create a program to do that, but we're actually curing things with our drugs, so give us all the money you used to give to doctors, or give us more of the pie, right? And this is very similar, I think, in situations like this, where you're going to have a lot of the makers of the technology often will oversell the technology. Certainly, electronic health records have been oversold. If you talk to any doctor that works with Epic, I mean, they are often incredibly frustrated by their interactions with a very difficult to use user interface, et cetera. And so, yeah, I mean, that's where we have to really closely look at the law because the one thing that I think a lot of the tech and finance firms have done, and I really document in my book, is they really know how to influence politics. You know, the second largest uh, lobbyist last year was Google. Um, you know, so if you're wondering, like, where, where are the real political influencers? A lot of times it's people telling a story about software or programs being superior to human judgment when, in fact, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But the law and the policy is going to determine the ultimate scope and intensity and pace of, ado of adoption. Yeah. We have a question here from one of our regulars, Tom. <laughs> yeah. 
the, the first is kind of a comment in the fact that you said being used in the legal industry. And I'm just wondering if that's so they can have more hands going into more pockets. <laughs> um, but yeah. seri seriously, what I'm wondering is, is Anwar, a couple of years ago, um, put on a movie which was attended to by a high school group and some of the normal people here. And we had a very different outlook as far as how the technology is used, whereas all the younger people thought it was wonderful if they did a search and then they went to Facebook or they did another search, they would get advertisements up for something they had looked for before. Right. And all of the older people were creeped out by it and really don't like it. Uh, and then you go, if I go to my parents' generation who are 92, they think it's far safer to give their credit card to a waiter than to use it on the internet. And how is all of that balanced? And do you see those generational changes of the different, when you talk to younger groups versus talking to older groups and how they view um, their invasion of their privacy? Great. So I think that the, uh, there are anecdotes on the other side for the younger groups. So for example, if you look at the rise of Snapchat, which is sort of ephemeral chatting, that is a classic example where people that are often assumed to have no boundaries and no worries about their image online are very deliberately choosing to have their photos self-destruct in 10 seconds or those sort of messages, et cetera. Um, ironically, that was actually also looked into by Wall Street uh, in the form of a messaging service called Symphony. Um, which said, oh, our business model is, you know, your message is self-destruct in 10 seconds, so you never get caught for anything, right? <laughs> you know, so, so these sort of, you know, the technology here has many, and they, they recently had to sign a settlement with Eric Schneiderman, the Attorney General of New York, sort of backing off of that. And, you know, that sort of thing is like a very, like that, that technology is really critical, you know, how, how it's used by some groups or others. So I would, I, I admire the folks that are trying to maintain some privacy and some control over the digital identity. However, one thing that's really interesting about Snapchat, though, is that they actually were misleading their users about how ephemeral the photos were. So the Federal Trade Commission filed a complaint against them, and they had to sort of change up and sort of reform, et cetera. So perhaps we're really overestimating the degree to which we can have a forgettable past in, given the current technical infrastructure. Now, the generational thing, where I see it also is there was this really interesting anecdote in Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys, where he said the young people that the Securities and Exchange Commission loved high frequency trading. They were like, this is the future. It's like the fastest fa stock trading in the world. The more seasoned regulators had a real problem with it. They really worried about it. And there, in that situation, I'm very f strongly on the side of the more seasoned regulators, of the older folks, because I think they realized, they had seen enough of history to realize that, say, a lot of what had gone on in 2008 was a recapitulation of pyramid trusts from the 1920s, right? If, if you, the problem with a lot of modern financial regulation is that too many folks just don't have a sense of history in terms of how uh, the same sort of problematic behaviors just keep reappearing in different guises. So I do think that that's a, a problem, and I think that that's where you know you have to. There has to be due respect to experience and to a sense of history, not in a, including both personal experience and knowledge of history. And, and, I, and I hope to see more of that in the future regarding privacy. So, yeah. By the way, I feel somewhat qualified to comment because I feel like I'm exactly in between. I'm at the median age. Of, <laughs> but maybe I'm a little over the median age. So maybe, I, maybe I'm just tilted or biased toward the older side. I don't know. But yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's, that's kind of where I wanted to bring my question. I mm -hmm. should preface this by saying that I'm a lecturer in the Department of Communication, and I teach social and new media. That's, that's the area oh, that I great. focus on, including courses in media literacy. So I loved hearing you say that you know media literacy is, yes. in some ways, the new literacy, um, which could be a longer conversation, but I want to ask my question. Um, <laughs> so one of the sort of things I sort of get as an impression uh, of some of the conversations here uh, is that uh, a lot of this goes down to gut feelings, right? Experience, gut feelings mm. that... You know, I have a sense of someone who is an older and more experienced trader has a sense of history, what other problems might be. Um, somebody who's worked for a long time in a particular professional field has that experience. Mm. I, I would venture to say, as someone who teaches media literacy to, to undergraduate students right here at UNE, is it's not that they don't understand history. I, I ask my students quite frequently, do you know all of your information is being traded, uh, dissected, divided by Facebook? And they absolutely understand that 
fully, full stop. They get that. But for them, the trade-off is absolutely worth it. And so when I sort of hear this conversation um, talking about, well, you know, we need to respect that gut, I wonder what that's based off of. I mean, it really feels like it's just, okay, well, experience, and, and we know that this, this doesn't feel right to me, mm -hmm. seems to be the basis of a lot of these arguments. I mean, right down to the eSports one, which I will happily debate you about. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, like, okay, sure. I mean, where's the distinction between watching somebody play a video game and watching the Patriots play? What, what's the difference, right? You know, so for, and to, to most people who are undergraduates here at UNA, they wouldn't see much of a distinction between those two. And I feel like that's almost kind of a microcosm of the, this gut feeling we're talking about here. So what, what really is under that? Is it, is it more than just a gut feeling that this doesn't feel right? Sure, so I will say I, I am totally open-minded on the esports, and I, I want to discuss it further. I would say in the Facebook thing, I think that's based on a lot of study of problematic uses of user data. So I would say, for instance, if you look at like the, the ever edgier uses of the data, ever edgier recombinations, mm -hmm. that the feeling of creepiness is not merely like a gut feeling or something that you know is like you like some, one person likes vanilla, one person likes chocolate. It really is a uh, an apprehension of potential danger because people, and unfairness, because people do realize that, you know, in the, the, when you have a world in which Facebook is patenting ways of ranking people's credit scores based on their friend list, that they can be put in very difficult situations. Like, for example, you know, if you have relations, poor, the classic problem of the poor relations, right? Do you decide to unfriend them? I, uh, now, and, and, and the social meaning of the unfriending is also something that's so interesting, right? Because I mean, I certainly, after a few political arguments of unfriended family members, and that was not a good decision, actually. I should have just, <laughs> I, I should have just hidden them, you know? But I was not technologically savvy enough to think about that possibility. But I think that, you know, when, when we look at, for example, the 2011 Federal Trade Commission settlement with Facebook, they point out three very specific situations where Facebook represented one thing to the users and then did something completely different. So they have really caught them in a lie and they find the millions of dollars and they've put them under a watch. And so in that case, I mean, I just have to wonder, yes, I understand, but I also would, would question the logic of the trade-off because I don't think there's a trade-off. I think it's more like people, the lawyers in general model our relationship to these platforms as like contractual, like we're signing a terms of service. I don't see it that way. I think it's like administrative law or really like feudalism. Like we've, we're entering into the kingdom of Facebook. Zuckerberg is the king. We accept the terms. If you don't accept the terms, you're kicked out of the kingdom. And so I, th I don't think that we can talk about the language of trade-offs. We can talk about um, thanks to a certain forms of network power and lack of coordination of resistance, we are all thrown into a world in which we're in these platforms and we don't govern them properly yet, but we will eventually, I hope, but yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's maybe their hope. But, but I, I do, I totally get your point about esports and I, I, I could get into, I mean, I, I should probably back off of that one because, you know, but I, but I do feel like the, the difference between it, it reminds me of a, of a report by um, Leo, Leo Cass on bioethics from about 2000 and he talked about what would dancing be like without gravity? And uh, you know, <laughs> you know what, would we go to the ballet and watch it or would it seem like, well, this is something else? And I feel like, in some ways, when I'm watching the esports, like I guess maybe if I had played them enough that I really understood how the programming behind them worked, you know. Whereas there's something far more legible about the skilled exemplary performance of the human body itself. Like I, I sort of know that better. But, but I, I, I need to think more about it. But thank you. It's a great question. We have uh, one final question from a UNE undergraduate student. Yeah. Hi. Um, going back to the whole generationality and like amygdala stimulating and all that good stuff. Um, I work at a restaurant and I frequently see seven and eight year olds ignoring the coloring pages I give them because they're on their iPhones. Yeah. Um, my three year old sister is proficient at an iPad um, <laughs> because it's more stimulating than watching TV. Um, with technology becoming more and more almost of a right to younger and younger generations, how do we prevent um, kind of like the Big Brother-esque 1984 setting that your book kind of alluded to a couple of times. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, no, I, I guess one of the things, that one first step might be to privilege iPad online experiences that involve some level of creativity 
So, I mean, I have a friend that works at this company, I think it's called 53, which is like online drawing. And I've looked at like the drawings that the people create and I'm like, oh, these are wonderful. Like these are really creative, they're really interesting. And I, and maybe I'm being too judgy in, on this, you know, and I, I but maybe I, I feel like there's something inherently more engaging of the faculties of something like that online drawing experience rather than like uh, Candy Crush or I don't know, you know, where it's just like a bean is moving or I, I don't know. <laughs> you know. Or maybe there's, maybe I shouldn't make fun of Candy Crush. I'm so, I apologize to the Candy Crush players. But, you know, there's certain games that really are like what Bentham called pushpin, right? Where it's just like, you're just really just moving a little thing around. It's not that intellectually engaging. I think that's gonna be where the future battles are fought. I, I don't think that really, given how much pressure there is on parents and others to work and how hard it is to find adequate childcare and other sort of issues like that and the peer pressures that go along, it often is gonna be very much a losing battle, you know, in terms of like saying the screen time is strictly limited or something. But as we find better and better ways of maybe engaging people and making transparent what that experience is and making it a more positive and, and open-ended and engaging one, maybe that's a route to a better, better future as well toward the respect versus replacement, so. Thanks. Thanks. With that, uh, we conclude this event. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I promise you a great lecture, and you had. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.